All right, it is five o'clock. It's time for me to pass this mic on to SGP, who will be passing it on to these guys. <laughs> this is the this is the panel with all of these guys. We've got. Let's go. Let's, let's just go ahead and introduce everybody real quick. Okay, awesome. Um, so welcome everyone. We are just having a very informal panel here on uh, with many of these lovely participants. I'll give them all a chance to introduce themselves. And there will be plenty of time for uh, audience questions because we have a full hour. So if you didn't see me earlier today, I'm Justin. I'm just going to be leading a casual discussion here. So hold your hand up with questions as we have time later. Oh, and my handle is SGP or Samsung Galaxy Player. And no, I'm not sponsored by Samsung. All right. <laughs> we'll pass the mic down. Me chiamano an animal. My nome è an animal. <laughs> what about English? My, uh, they call me an animal, but my name is an animal. <laughs> Eat the mic. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Ricardo. Ricardo Spongy. You may know me as Fluffy Pony. I feel like I said that already today. <laughs> My name's Shamik. I'm on the uh, security team at Coinbase. <laughs> <laughs> name's Paul. <laughs> name's Paul. You might know me by Endogenic. Tweeting or Tweeting Paul S. <laughs> it's not really clear if it's plural or just singular in my last name. Awesome. Oh, and pulls up. <laughs> Perfect. So, Anonymo, you can keep the mic. Um, so, I know you spent uh, the last several hours talking about Covery and what privacy means to you, but I think it's a good opening question to sort of go down the line. If you, since you already gave a two-hour talk about <laughs> privacy, if you could just give a 30-second one here. But just what does privacy mean to you, and why do you feel like what, what projects are you doing with Monero to help further that? And if, if, you're, if that's a not applicable question, what does sure. privacy mean to you? <clears throat> well, uh, I don't believe there is such thing as privacy. Um, I think what we're doing is uh, attempting to achieve the impossible, but it's not really impossible yet because we haven't proven that. If anyone <laughs> was here for the first part of the talk, they would know exactly what I'm talking about. So why am I doing this? I'm attempting to emulate, hack an emulation of bringing two points of space-time into one while still retaining the same qualities. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. Why? Because I think uh, that's the essence of love, and essentially that's what we're expressing. Um, but, you know, think of all the name calling you've been called just because you use this software, and then you can just laugh at them saying, no, I'm just, I, I just want to join two points of space time together into one. Um, and what does it mean for Monero? Is that the. Just what do you, you see you're working on Colvery? Do you want to take a second and talk about Colvery? Oh, well, okay, so Colvery will. Do you want the textbook definition of. The, the quick definition. Oh, wait, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you use Monero, when you use basically anything, um, you have a, an origin IP address if you're using the internet, right? Uh, essentially, unless you're using an overlay network, which anonymizes your anonymizes you know your location or your address, and that's what Cobra will do. Essentially, completing the the I don't know was it a cycle or circle of the Monero project goal to have this this truly decentralized, trustless functionally private software and community. Um, so you can have really actually uh, anonymized transactions. Perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Anonymous. Yeah. If you can pass the mic down, we can continue their privacy discussions. I think from my perspective, privacy... Oh, I'm eating the mic, sorry. I think privacy is a basic human right, or it should be a basic human right. Um, and, and that's not to say that I am anti-law enforcement I, you know, there are bad people in the world, you know, they're murderers and stuff, and sure, no problem, law enforcement needs to catch them. I just don't think they need to snort up all my data to do so. Uh, I'm against passive surveillance. I think that that's not a, a, an objectively good way of um, enforcing laws. And uh, I think that, unfortunately, what's happened over the past 30 years, which is roughly the time period we've had traceable money, is law enforcement has gotten really lazy. And what they've decided to do is uh, put the burden of, um, of enforcing laws, the burden of figuring out who is suspicious, 
they've put that on financial institutions. So, you know, you get a deposit of a certain size and your bank reports you. Like, why is your bank the lawmaker? Why is your bank the detective who decides that you're suspicious? Like, surely, like, law enforcement officers should be the ones doing that. And, uh, and I think that that's what we're trying to achieve with Monero is a, is a world that, you know, we, we're, we're, not, we're not able to solve everything, but at least we can try and um, solve the problem of passive surveillance and force things to go back to the way they were when law enforcement agencies did their job. Thank you. I am surprisingly in agreement with roughly with what you're saying, which is working at an exchange means we have to be an enforcer for laws that we don't necessarily get to decide, right? And so if it's like if we have to give information out about a user to a law enforcement agency, it's because we are being forced to. We have to do so in order to do business in the U.S. Uh, but back to the actual privacy bit. It's a basic human expectation, Right, and it's where and how, the circumstances in which you're communicating, who you're talking to, right? I talk to my doctor, I have an expectation of privacy. Uh, I talk to a journalist, I have no such expectation, right? And for us, particularly in a product team, it's how do we make sure that that expectation of privacy carries over to all the different like, expectations a user has? Thank you. Um, yeah, just from a basic definition standpoint, I would say privacy seems to be the option to disclose what you want to disclose. Um, so I would say to your point, giving that option to the users is exactly what we need to do. Um, and you know, uh, in all of these technologies, there is the interface with the real world, and that's where information that gets disclosed really lives. So um, yeah, people need to have that kind of option. Awesome. So, Paul, you can keep the mic for a second. I have a quick question for you. So, you, you represent uh, MyMonero. You're the CEO of MyMonero, which yeah. is a common web wallet and also recently a, uh, an application wallet for Monero. So, what are the, can you speak broadly about some of the challenges that you faced developing, maintaining these, these services for the Monero ecosystem? Yeah, totally. Um, that's a really good question. I think probably the biggest challenge we have right now is keeping up with Monero. And the reason that that's important primarily is so that all of the usage of people on my Monero blends into all of the other Monero usage, you know, so that nothing stands out. Um, you know, for that purpose, we've had to port a lot of the Monero cryptography techniques and protocol implementations. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's uh, so much of a challenge because I enjoy it, but I think um, the other really big thing we work on is making sure that this technology is accessible. Uh, one of the things Ricardo mentioned earlier was that people just don't know these terms like address and view key. And so understanding what those things mean in real life and real usage uh, and translating that is definitely a big task. So how do you approach uh, finding out what's usable to uh, everyday people? Do you have like test groups? How do you consult to figure out what is a streamlined experience for people. Right, no, yeah, that's exactly it. So there are uh, official and unofficial test groups, you know, official in the sense that like there are people that I regularly talk to about this stuff and they give me all kinds of feedback and we work on next versions and things like that. Um, but the other thing is um, I really enjoy talking to people about just how they use Monero in general and listening to the sticking points or how people design services that use Monero or are built on top of Monero and um, where the technology um, you know, uh, it needs to be massaged, basically. Like, for example, um, recently someone was working on a way to include um, order details in a transaction. And, you know, figuring out exactly the right way to do that, um, you know, it definitely requires analysis of the technology. Perfect. So thank you. I think we can move on uh, to Shamik. We have a, just qu a question for you. If you want to talk more specifically about Monero, let me know. But I didn't want to keep putting you on the spot for Monero-related questions. Why Monero? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, we had well, that you can answer why Monero. <laughs> yeah, so we had that question earlier today um, with one of your coworkers. Um, but I, I'm curious, Coinbase has gone through a series of different approaches to two-step authentication for its applications. If, if I remember correctly, they previously, or you previously had a partnership with Authy, and then that was dropped uh, for, uh, in favor of other systems. So can you speak to the difficulties related to 
user security and actually logging into these accounts and also specifically talk about how two-factor is kind of a, an important role in that. I think the important thing to do here first is establish what a Coinbase user looks like. Um, one of our goals as an exchange is to make cryptocurrency available as like an on-ramp, right? We want people who otherwise would never interact with crypto or crypto-like systems to be able to buy, sell, hold, trade, send off platform, just interact with crypto in any sort of way. Uh, with that comes with no expectation of any kind of savviness with regard to their user account and user security, right? There's no way we can make sure that this user has like a safe email address, for example, or that they haven't reused passwords in places. Right? Or they haven't even done something as simple as keep their TOTP seed as a screenshot in their sent drive, in their, in their email. So at one point, like you lose the email address, you lose the TOTP seed. Um, so with that said, part of the work that we do is we try to find 2FA methods that are A, usable by most users. Right? It's on their device or it's available to them to use it through the, through the browser or what have you. Um, and then it's actually like they'll interact with it. Um, one of the most interesting pieces of individual feedback I've gotten for the user is asking, why do we do device verification emails? Can't you tell it's just me, right? And well, no, we can't, which is why we have to do device verification. So for us, we're saying, how difficult can we make it for an attacker while still making it trivial for a user? Um, there's a world where you could imagine even Coinbase branded hardware that just does 2FA for you, right? However, we want to implement it on the other side. But that's like a far out world, someplace that we'd love to get to. Awesome. Uh, I have a tough question for you, Ricardo, if that's all right. <laughs> this I'll is, allow it. <laughs> good. This is in relation to Tari. So you are the co-founder of Tari. Um, in the past, you have been very vocal against a lot of the ICO and uh, essentially a lot of the problems that was created in the Ethereum ecosystem that was pr perpetuated by hype, perpetuated by people being able to make these digital assets for the sake of essentially spreading hype and gathering money. So I'm curious, with Tari, can you speak to how Tari itself is, which, which enables this sort of activity on the Monero platform and, br and essentially brings this sort of ICO culture closer to the Monero ecosystem. How this, uh, how, how you reconcile that and how you are able to, uh, well, what, what, how you sort of approach that sort of thought process. Sure, I, I think the first thing is that I don't have a, a sort of standing opinion that all ICOs are bad and every ICO that will ever exist will be bad. Um, I think that ICOs in general are regulatory, from a regulatory perspective, are murky. I think they're ethically murky. Um, I think they're most, mostly mishandled and mismanaged. And I think they're largely done by people that would be laughed at the door if they went to traditional VC. And, and that's you know, not to say, again, that every, every um, ICO is bad. Um, I think there's scope for security tokens. I think security tokens are really interesting. If you can divvy up your company, um, and instead of issuing shares, you issued a, to a security token, and that could trade freely on secondary markets. That's something that is interesting to me as a, as a way of doing an IPO, uh, IPO style um, organization or public company. Um, I think that we are still a while away from understanding uh, what the laws are gonna look like around that, from having a, a regulatory framework that encourages good behavior. Because, I mean, ICOs are not decentralized. It's, there's a central issuer. And they've got to comply with laws. You know, we're not, this is not a decentralized technology. Um, and I think we need to wait for regulators to see what they do. Um, and, and from Tari's perspective, I mean, you know, Tari's permissionless. It's not like we're going to have a permis permissioned environment where it's like, please apply here to launch your token. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll decide. So, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do. And, and that's not like we can prevent them um, from doing that. I mean, someone, someone can build a colored coins protocol on Monero tomorrow, it, it wouldn't be a particularly good idea, but I mean, it could be done. So, you know, someone can do that and launch an ICO using Monero, um, and we wouldn't be able to stop them. So I think that the, on the one hand, there's hope for the future that ICOs will become less murky. There's hope that like security tokens will be something that's interesting, um, and, and Tari will be ready for that coming wave. Um, and on, on the other hand, even if uh, I felt differently and I thought that 
every ICO was bad, I still wouldn't be able to stop them. So a uh, follow-up question with that. Uh, you, uh, so Tari is merge mined with Monero, but it's its own separate chain. So are you concerned that Tari as a company will be exposed to the liability of potentially being able to change consensus on that chain in order to yeah, manipulate these sort of ICOs in the platform? Are you concerned about any sort of liability that Tari would have there? I don't think so. I mean, the, the, the organizational structure is, I mean, we own the Tari.com domain and the Tari Twitter handle and that, but the organizational structure is really Tari Labs. Um, and and that's, the, that's the cool thing that, that we've created. Um, and Tari Labs is an organization that um, has employees and is employing more people in Johannesburg, in South Africa, and they will be working, um, they are working already um, on some of the, the stuff that the learning curve ready um, to, the, to allow them to build Tari. Um, but they're not going to be building in isolation. They're going to be contributing to Tari and they're going to be contributing to Monero. So, you know, they're, like, the organization itself is just an organization that contributes to an open source protocol. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Okay, now off to Anonymal. <laughs> so, uh, in previous conversations that we've had, um, you've expressed uh, that Covery is not, uh, it's not just meant for the I2P ecosystem, it's meant to be at its core an anonymizing router. Can you speak to, in the future, uh, Covery's connections with I2P and what other sort of technologies that you're considering, perhaps even if it's several years down the road, using with, with uh, Covery? Okay, yeah, so I want to keep it open-ended because, uh, as I discussed earlier, this is an ongoing development, and we can't get, uh, like, uh, if you're ever in jazz, you have, they're called pet chords, right? You go to those pet chords where you, okay, I'm going to play that F minor, da 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 because it's comfortable, it's there. So no way am I saying anything we do is going to be forever, and, uh, you know, I2P is what it is now, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be that later. Um, you want to know what other options? There's not really many other options at this point. Um, there's attempts at options um, everywhere from, uh, but those aren't really an uh, anonymizing. Um, GNU Net is one attempt. Um, Dandelion. As I said earlier, the Bitcoin's non-solution to anonymity. Um, CJDNS, um, Hornet, I mentioned Hornet. Um, we need more research, honestly. I mean, for every crypto enthusiast you know, there's like, you know, a twelfth of that person is an anonymity developer. So, I mean, it's really minuscule, really small amount of people working on this type of technology. So we just need more people, more interest, um, more physicists, mathematicians, especially more physicists because this problem is not going away anytime soon. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. And uh, like, I, unless you had any specific uh, technologies that you were really looking for. You mentioned dandelion. Um, yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. No, they draw a line on the graph and they're like, here, you're anonymous. Like, okay. No. Okay. So I'm not joking. You go look at the specs. It's just, okay. Okay. No, I don't go there. So um, I'm a student at the University of Minnesota. I have spoken to one of the professors there who does Tor research. Mm -hmm. And he said that he previously did some initial look at I2P several years ago. The protocol has likely changed significantly since then. But according to his own words, he said that they did not even bother publishing papers about how insecure it was because it was essentially self-evident. Um, <laughs> and it was very obvious. So generally... This is proof. <laughs> <laughs> So this is like, like back is, in, uh, this is several years ago. So okay. generally, for the question for you, what general sort of confidence do you have that I2P is a generally rigorous and researched <laughs> protocol um, in terms of protecting the anonymity that you would have? As he scratches his head. Um, that's a good joke. Yeah, <laughs> existential <laughs> crisis. Well, okay, that's a great question. Um, have you looked at the specs? Has anyone here looked at the specs, done their own research? Has anyone here looked at the Tor specs, done their own Tor research? I mean the specs, the, like the specs, where you're laying out the equations. Yeah, see, no one's raising their hands because, okay, we've got a, a hand back there, cool. I mean, but, and then again, how many people are knee deep in the code developing this stuff? See, that number just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can, you know, anyone can say, oh yeah, blah, 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 blah. You can throw millions of dollars at research. 
uh, you can throw all kinds of fancy equations out. Like, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to beat up on dandelion, but it looks fantastic on paper until you realize it just doesn't work. So, I don't know, am I even answering the question? It's, there's, there's really, there's no like safe, you know, oh, I feel cuddly feeling this system. Oh my God, this is great. I feel perfect. I'm so private. It's, it's essentially, yes. I mean, this is the ultimate DEF CON expression of this is just we're hacking one hack after a hack after a hack after a hack. I mean, that's like life. Where we're just trying to get through this, and there's no perfect solution. Well, that was depressing. <laughs> Sorry, man. This is sad, you know, sad but true. On that high note. Yeah, exactly. On that high note, let's open up for questions. I, well, I have. A, I don't know how this works. Uh, yeah, you're a, you're I welcome coin, to. I have a Coinbase thing. You're welcome to ask okay. it. Well, actually, I would like but, to answer why. Why Monero? For, for him? For Coinbase? Yeah, is that what we were discussing? Oh. Or no. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, just so we get this on recording. Well, I, have that same, I have the same answer too. I have a Why Monero, yes. I have a question. Oh, that is what you were going to say. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead. You go okay. So uh, in my talk, I forgot to mention. Okay, so like, okay, oh, Anonymous doesn't believe in privacy. What the, what the heck, man? So essentially, privacy still is, I believe, to be ill-defined. And I think what we're trying to define privacy uh, is essentially varied aspects of relative publicity. Because there's no such thing as being private. Because you cannot exist while not existing yet. At least I have yet to see the proof. Any math? math uh, any math? Anything. Anything about that. I talked about that in the first half of my talk. Okay. So, great. Nothing's private. So we can take that out of the reasons why X can't use Y. Next thing. Monero is essentially a language between two points in space-time, right? I mean, I'm like, you can meme me, say, like, space-time, you know, you'll see that. I'll probably do it if you don't. Aliens. Aliens, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you want to have that private transaction. Essentially, you just want it with that other point in space-time. So Monero is a language, all right? These are all languages in which we're expressing. Now, for any X institution to discriminate someone based on language. That is flat out discrimination. I don't think Coinbase has a real reason or even the government to have any uh, reason to discriminate based on language, nor can they. I mean, this is like a constitutional thing. So I wonder, I mean, with that perspective, which is absolutely proven, uh, why not Monero? It's proven. Yeah. What, what, what's proven? <laughs> uh, I'm not the person answering this question. Well, I was just going to say I wanted to buy a whole bunch of stuff on Project Coral Reef, and I can't get any Monero, you know, so that's why Monero. Yeah. That's, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for saying so. That means a lot. I want to buy a Mariah Carey CD. <laughs> you see, look at all the suffering children. They can't get their Mariah Carey CDs. Children dying. Yes. Literally. Literally. Everyone know I love Mariah Carey. Yeah. Uh, you see? Well, somebody has to ship you a CD. <laughs> so do we want more audience questions? Yeah. I, I, yes. <laughs> we, we have a lot of extra time. Yeah. It, we can, and to avoid any more brigading of why Monero is not on Coinbase, let's have some additional questions. I guess I'll just hand back the mic then. I'm, I'm just kidding. So uh, th this is kind of a question for everybody here because, I mean, Tari is kind of open source. Well, I guess Coinbase isn't, so you can sit tight. But you, if you have an opinion on this, please do. Kavri is open source. My Monero is, well, okay, you know, once again, it's kind of open source. But the, the, I, I'm a UX person, you know, uh, and the UX is really, it's, at its core, it's all about empathy. It's understanding what are people not getting right and why are they not getting it right and what can we do so that way they can get it right, you know, kind of, so that, 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 whole, that whole piece of designing for the user and not for yourself. And open source technology is just at the absolute worst with this. It's filled with developers, and so these things work. They are functional, which is great. That's a great first step, but they suck to use. And this is the, the case with Bitcoin, and this is even exponentially more the case with Monero just because we have these privacy technologies layered on top of that. Like, what work is being done um, uh, on 
just to keep things user focused and, and we can always say well they should just read the manual and this is you know and I understand we're in the early stages of all these different type of stuff but eventually if we're talking about mass adoption like everyone likes to say it, we have to start thinking users first every other person first and you know that's actually one of the things I appreciate about Coinbase um, that this is one of the things that they, re they really aim for and of course there's pros and cons here and there in achieving this, but just you know, like in terms of recovery, what, what um, and you actually touched a little bit about this, you know, make it so you, you plug and play and it's in and then you don't have to think about it. But like in terms of Tari and in terms of my Monero and stuff like, I just want to hear everybody's thoughts like, um, what, how, how are we keeping things user centric? How are we keeping things user first without sacrificing at all on security and privacy? Is that even possible? Because um, since they seem on opposite ends of the scale. You already answered the the code oh, part in you your in your question. I think um, from my perspective, you're correct in saying that they're trade-offs, and so there's all, and there always are going to be trade-offs. Um, using my Monero is really easy, but it's uh, you sacrificing some privacy, you're sacrificing um, part of your security model even um, in order to use that as opposed to running a full node. Um, that's not going to change. I think what we can do is we can more effectively communicate to people uh, the differences, um, but I think that even that's largely unnecessary because a more paranoid person will naturally gravitate towards doing their own research, figuring out what they should be doing, and, and then running a full note anyway. Um, and somebody who just wants to get up and running is going to take the, the whatever is the lowest, uh, the easiest way to get in. They're going to use Edge or My Monero or something that is just like super simple. Um, and, and I think that the focus that we've had up to now has been on functionality. You know, it's been on like uh, first make it work. And we're starting to get to a point where we can say make it work well. Um, and and that is, that's definitely something that not only like Atari, but I know um, across the board, um, all of the, the wallet manufacturers um, and, and uh, software companies are interested in improving that user experience. I know Coinbase is interested in improving the user experience, but it is, it's progressive and it's iterative. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, we, you know, we, we have access to incredible resources. We have the forum funding system. There's all sorts of stuff that we can, that we can throw money at if we needed to, but uh, you know, as a community. But I think that it, it, it's largely premature um, in some respects. Um, and I think that there are organizations like My Monero, um, like Edge, like Cake Wallet, uh, like Monorujo, that are, are making efforts to um, improve the user experience without the need for us as a community to go and like try and figure out what the ultimate user experience is. Um, but it will get there. It just has to be iterative because that's the way that good open source software uh, is built. And, and to one, one more thing just to speak to your point is um, I know that a, large, a, a lot of open source software is clunky, but there are some really beautiful open source applications out there. So like, it's, not, it's not the method of building that is the problem. I think it's just that sometimes we tend to either not dog food it and we don't use our own applications, um, or we're just not speaking to users enough. Um, and there's, there's a, bit of a, a bit of a break between like the people sitting on IRC in Monero Dev on Freenode and poor De Brain who has to answer all the questions on Reddit. <laughs> so adding into that as well, one of our successes at Coinbase is being an abstraction forum core crypto interactions that a user has to do. Right? Our users, like we protect them from a lot of this complexity because they otherwise wouldn't interact with the system at all. And so there is space if you think about defining what your user actually is in open source, right? Who are you building it for? There's a world where your open source developer builds it for like the internal crypto team at Coinbase to use well, so that we can then make it available to our users easier, right? And so those types of abstraction layers and the degrees of complexity as you get further away from what is the core crypto operation is where you get better and better UX. You just focus a bit more on different pieces. So um, I agree with Ricardo about open source not being implicitly antagonistic to good user experience. I think it's just that, um, well, it's a few different things. So first of all, I want to mention, I had this teacher back in the day who said that Git, the tool for, for um, you know, it's used on Linux and yeah, version control. 
Um, it's not learner friendly, but it's very user friendly. And so there's a, a steep learning curve, but once you get there, it's extremely easy to use. And um, I found, to a certain degree, the same thing about the Monero CLI program. I think it's actually quite well designed, but I think that the reason it's able to be so well designed is that it's relatively straightforward to build something like that simply because you're just uh, relaying the specific data content that the user needs to interact with. Whereas um, with something like a GUI, um, I think that the phenomenon of design by committee tends to come in a little bit more because there are all these different ways you could do it and exactly for the reason that uh, there isn't as much interfacing with the user and you know all that like feedback that you get from that, that um, the exact use cases aren't made clear first of all. Awesome. And then you answer your question, Diego. <laughs> I have strong opinions on this since I've been writing soft security software for like 30 years. Um, your, your basic question is, you know, why isn't the, the application easy to use while not losing any privacy? Okay, and, and this is actually, you know, a question that the entire computing industry still hasn't solved, right? You look at a web browser and freaking HTTPS support, okay? Everybody here probably uses that, but, you know, as soon as you go to a website with a certificate you've never seen before, you know, you get this little dialog box up, probably everybody just clicks OK, all right? So the fact is, we don't have any working examples of good security with good usability. They don't exist. And it's an ongoing problem. It's unsolved in the entire industry. Thank you. you. Go ahead, Power Cycle. Okay. Uh, for, for Coinbase, um, and this may not be directly to your department, but since you're here. So uh, about the, like the world police thing and policing what people transact, I've heard many stories of where people were sending money to maybe a dark neck market or some sort of address and have their Coinbase account just freeze and locked. Um, first question is, do you publish the list of blacklisted addresses so that someone doesn't accidentally send their money and get their account locked? And two, if you don't, um, why not pop up a little like warning to say like, hey, you may be <laughs> transacting <laughs> with the, and, 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 and you know what they do and they're locked in, sure but, you but. Are you a terrorist? <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know how much of this I can actually answer without getting tackled <laughs> from behind. Uh, but we don't publish the list of blacklisted addresses. Um, a lot of this is we don't, it's retroactive. We don't know until law enforcement comes and tells us and then we have to start cleaning things up. Now, even in that circumstance, I don't know how much we're just able to then publish what we've been given and told to clean up from. Um, with that said, I would love to give a little pop-up to say, are you sure you want to send this transaction? Um, but I'm pretty sure our growth people would tell me not to. Okay, just so we, I'm going to repeat the question just to make sure it's recorded. So the question was, uh, if, if there is a situation where you already have the addresses, why don't you let them know that this, this behavior would be flared? Uh, part of that is just implementation-wise, right? Um, another thing is, uh, some of these addresses that are being locked are also those scam addresses that you see on Twitter. Um, and it's, it's, we all kind of, yeah, it's, it's all over the place. So. It's, some of it is protective, right? We lock the account because, hey, you obviously don't know that you shouldn't send fake Elon Musk 10 ETH uh, with the hope of getting like 50 Oops. ETH back, right? And so it's, it's kind of a catch-all system right now. It's just implementation-wise. Uh, some of this is we'd love to explore it and see how much we're allowed to do that versus, you know, we could publish, that's a scam address. Don't ever send ETH there, right? For the law enforcement related stuff, I'm not sure where our opportunities are. 
All right, so we have a question over there. So going back to uh, what you were saying earlier about the number of people that have actually gotten into the I2P spec and the implementation and really you are knee deep in the code, um, there's been a lot of, there's a, there's a big rift between like I2PD and Covery and um, do you think that is worth reconciling and trying to, um, trying to get that uh, in a, a, a more amicable situation where cross contributions are able to be made, and if so, how would you see that happening? For what? Yeah. We're waiting for the mic to come back. Because I was there at the beginning. Yes, yeah, and can I also I'll ask a question and like perfect. Okay. Well, first I would ask, how do you define uh, reconcile? But Rick has to say something. So, <laughs> so I, I was there like right at the beginning when the rift happened, um, and. It's like I have I have mad res I have respect for anyone who's working on privacy software, um, but the dude working on it like upped and disappeared for for a long period of time, multiple months, and we were just like left hanging, and so we continued the work on ITPD but in our own fork, and the people that were left hanging in channel going well I have no idea what's going on, they continued the work on that fork. And when he suddenly pitched up, he lost his mind because we hadn't done things his way. And, I, you know, I mean, my concern with, with reconciliation um, is it's all, it's all fine to, like, try and reconcile that, you know, heal the divide and all that. We can all sing Kumbaya. But what happens when he ups and leaves again? And unfortunately, just the structure of that project is it's a benevolent dictator. It's not community-driven. And uh, he's not very benevolent as far as dictators go. And so I just, I don't, you know, having been there, I just don't see value in trying to, trying to solve that. We have a really good working relationship with the rest of the I2P developers. Um, we go to CCC uh, as often as we can. We go to, we sit with the I2P guys at CCC. We figure out ways that we can, uh, we can work with them from a protocol perspective. And I think that's, that's we're doing like the best that we can do um, uh, in terms of, interacting with ITP, uh, the organization, and making sure we stick to specs um, and future specs that they might, might publish until such time as we find a better technology. Sure. Okay, and let's say you and I are collaborating on something, right? And let's say I'm a malicious person, like in, in attitude, demeanor, I, I'm immature, I call you names, you know, whatever, you, you brush it off. And then you get to the code, and then you realize this code I'm giving you, it's also malicious. I mean, it's pure shit. It's literally either, either I am so incompetent that I honestly don't know what I'm doing, or I'm actually pre intending to do this so I can uh, watermark routers and essentially, you know, because, you know, memory is, of course, you know, it's just memory. It's always initialized, right? You know, there's no such thing. I don't know. Okay, so, uh, so you, you do that. You do it over and over again. You do... You, you try over and over again, and nothing changes. So I ask you, what would you do? Do you, do you find a healthy and e e extremely intelligent, capable community to collaborate with, or do you keep using malicious code with a malicious person? It just, I don't understand what's to reconcile. I, I don't understand. I mean, personally, it's, it all comes down to the code, in my opinion. Okay, so I have a follow-up question with, uh, with Ricardo. Can you speak a little bit more broadly with the, in the narrow ecosystem? I know I'm aware of several situations where we've had contributors that uh, did not work well with the culture of Monero. Can you speak to uh, rec sort of the sim similar situation where you have someone who might be gifted in code but just doesn't have the sort of culture to work with the Monero team? Oh, we're talking about fire ice now. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I only implied that. We're talking about people that may or may not. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, like, like, uh, there's a way of doing things in, in the Monero, amongst the Monero developers. And these, the things that we do are not difficult. Hang out in RSC as often as you can. We have relays you know, through Matrix, Slack, uh, Discord. So you don't have to use IRC even. And there are tons of developers that don't. Um, but like, 
you know, communicate so that, or just be there so that you can see when, like, people are picking stuff up. Um, I think that's a pretty important tenant. And then when you submit code, just, you know, you're submitting it to the Monero project under the conditions and licenses the Monero project uses. You cannot write your own license <laughs> and attach it to a PR. Um, and, and then when all of these things aren't working and you're not communicating with people, um, and people are asking you, please come communicate with us, um, then don't rage quit. You know, I mean, the, I, think, I think these are three basic things that, that most Monero contributors are happy to do. Um, and, and I mean, we have, uh, we've had nearly 500 people contribute to Monero over the past four and a bit years. We've had one problem child. I think that speaks to, to the, the, the way the developers work with each other. Um, and don't get me wrong, there, there are many frustrating things. Um, there are people waiting for me to merge PRs. <laughs> They've been waiting this whole week. You know, like they, there are people that get irritated with me. There are people that get irritated. Uh, we get irritated with each other. Um, there are people that get irritated with, the, with things Howard says. And, you know, I mean, all the time. <laughs> but I think we all have a mutual respect for each other. Um, and, and it is extreme. I mean, you have to really go off the rails to, to break that respect down to the point where no one actually cares if you walk away. Um, I mean, you have, to, you have to be a problem child of note, where, where like that, that respect for that person from a technical perspective is gone. Um, and that's, that's what ended up happening there. You know, I mean, like we, we really tried. I had many conversations where I was like, you know, I, I, I don't think you're a person who's trying to harm Monero. What can we do to try and like fix things and how can we work together? And please, can you not attach your own licenses to pull requests? It's bizarre. And, and eventually it's just, it's just, you know, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> Clearly. And, and that's sort of where, you know, where things ended up on. And, uh, and he's now working on Ryo, whatever it's called. And they, like, you know, he, he backported a pull, uh, fix um, for a wallet caching bug. And that's nice. And, you know, like, like they're going to obviously um, backport things that we do. And I think that that's probably the best that we're going to get in terms of a development relationship. Um, because he just is an impossible person to deal with. Cool. <laughs> I hope that answered yeah. the question. Your yeah. Disclosure. Oh, I was I was about to. There was the other point where that said issue that you explained was posted on GitHub rather than the VRP yeah. for the alleged reason that's, that that's the VRP true. is insufficient we, yeah. for yeah. dealing with no. VRP we, we, things. We have we have a vulnerability response program. We use Hacker One. We've used it for for some time now. Hacker One works surprisingly well. It's not difficult to use. Um, Everyone that discloses um, uh, issues to the Monero project uses Hacker One, um, and I think the you know where there are exceptions like um, Cisco Talis uh, uh, found uh, an issue and they posted up on GitHub. They're like, who do we report this to? Because clearly reading security.txt is too difficult, um, and and we pointed them in the right direction. We showed them where the the GPG keys were. They were able to send us stuff. Um, uh, it was out of band, it wasn't through the, the VRP. So we don't have a problem with like people reporting things outside of the VRP um, as long as they do so using the responsible some sort of responsible disclosure. Um, and that's kind of what you can hope for. And when someone just like almost purposely and maliciously goes and like um, takes things and, and publishes them out in the open without going through the responsible disclosure, um, stuff that we all know we really should be doing if you're even vaguely interested in security, then it's disruptive for the project as a whole. And I think, you know, we, we, we use the, the collaborative code construction contract that uh, Zero MQ developed, um, that, that Peter Hinchins put a lot of work in, into before he passed away. And the collaborative code construction contract is, is not a, um, it's not like a code of conduct. It's just a like, hey, if you're gonna work on the project, um, this is how it's administered, and these are some basic things. And it, it really, like, it, it makes it super difficult to take action against uh, anyone because it's like, this is the absolute last resort is that you actually block, any, block someone's access to, to um, submitting code to the project. And we didn't even get there. You know, we, we put up with a lot of stuff um, before we'd even get to the point where, as, as people have access to, like, 
um, collaborators stated on the GitHub repo that we'd actually take action and try and bar somebody from, from what they're doing. We're not there yet, but mm -hmm. you know, maybe we'll get there one day. <laughs> so I have a question. We can pass it to uh, Shamik. Um, so I know Coinbase uses uh, HackerOne also for responsible disclosure. Can you speak a little bit about how that has uh, either uh, ways that it has simplified the process? It, do people generally report things, and has it worked out well for Coinbase? So like any public bug bounty program with decent rewards, we get a strong mixture of terrible, terrible, um, just non-bugs. Uh, things like, you know, we can, your, your rate limits are bad. Well, like, your, your, <laughs> the requests are within the number of rate limit uh, and so forth. Um, we also get some like very high quality bugs. Uh, and it's just a matter of that's, that's what we have to deal with in order to get through it. Uh, for us, what helps here is every security vulnerability disclosure always goes through the same pipe. And we have our internal policy and program to actually deal with it in, in like a reasonable time frame. And so giving our support agents, for example, a place where they can say, if this is a real vuln and it looks like one, send it over there. Um, plus, uh, we do also get some product feedback uh, and we get a 10, I'd say once a quarter we get somebody reaching out to us thinking we are Bitcoin um, and <laughs> proposing, uh, you know, sending BIPs our direction that way. Uh, we have to let them down. They tend not to understand. Uh, so it's, it's public, right? Other, many people can interact with it. If you open a door like that, many people are going to walk through. Awesome. And uh, can you speak to some of the fallouts or difficulties that you've had with the HackerOne system? Has, has there been a case where people who have responsibly disclosed code with HackerOne have explained uh, or have expressed dislike, uh, uh, disappointment with how, this is, how Coinbase handled the issue and um, sort of the process that you have for handling the issues on HackerOne? Yeah, some of this is as a person doing a disclosure for a very complex piece of software, uh, you don't see the same things that we see. And so we have people who are doing just pure old fashioned ACH fraud, um, thinking that they've been, they found some new like class of vulnerabilities that's affecting Coinbase. And when we say like, that's not how the system works, it's a lot of like, you need to understand how these payment systems work to understand whether or not you're exploiting a vulnerability. Um, they, they don't get it, right? And for them, it's like, why is Coinbase, who is a large brand, not giving me like this money? Um, in, in some particular cases, we've had somebody come back in 30 to 60 days, be like, hey, my account's locked now. Uh, what happened? I was like, you did ACH fraud. You never trued up. Like, that's, this is what ACH fraud does to, to an account, to a person. Um, in other cases, it's just, it's mostly this information asymmetry. Um, some reporters have reported something that somebody else has just taken care of. Right, or has just like presented to us as well. Uh, given that we have millions of users and somebody's gonna run in, like two people are gonna run into the same thing at some point, uh, send that to us. Whoever comes in first or whoever comes in with a better, like well-explained system, uh, we'll give them the, the award. Uh, which means that if you're the other person, the bug still exists as far as you can tell, right? We can't fix things immediately. Uh, you're wondering why you didn't get paid out as well. Interesting. Okay, so we still have some time for more audience questions. Does anyone have any questions for anyone on the panel here? Yes, can we get the microphone moving that way? Hi, uh, I'm, I'm new to the Monero and ITP community. Welcome, welcome. Uh, uh, I've known the words for a while, but you know, it's cool. Um, I'm just curious, uh, you mentioned uh, a sort of hesitancy for ICOs and raising money that way. Uh, I don't know how the project is funded. Um, I'm just curious, how is it funded? I can speak to that. It's funded by watches. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. Uh, no, so, so that's a good question. Um, we have a general donation fund and people donate. There are some mining, mining pools who send a portion of their uh, their profit to the general donation fund um, and that's one way that uh, we cover monthly costs. We have build bots across um, all the platforms that we support, um, separate build bot instances for the GUI and for the CLI. Uh, that, that ends up being quite a big group of, uh, of machines that, that we have to pay for. Um, there's ARM devices that have to, that's on the internet that we pay for. 
there's our CDN costs are stupid because people are downloading Monero a lot. Um, and, and CDN costs are like four and a half thousand dollars a month. Um, and that all pretty much gets paid, paid for out the general donation fund. Um, and then we have some, we have like corporate sponsors in a sense. Um, so as an example, the company that Howard works for, um, they're one of the corporate sponsors because uh, they pay for his time and let him uh, work on Monero. Um, we have some corporate sponsors that uh, have given us licenses um, or, or like Dome 9 who handles um, uh, our firm and uh, some of our security infrastructure. Um, they ha give us Dome 9 uh, for free because we're an open source project. So we list them on the sponsors page. Um, we, we generally take a, a proactive um, approach with that where we'll say to someone, hey, we're using your stuff, we're an open source project, um, ca can you give us a reduced rate? And then they'll be like, sure, we'll give it to you for free. Um, and then to thank them, we go and, and put their logo up. Um, JetBrains have given us some stuff. So, you know, like across the board, we, we, we get some of that. And then we have something called the FFS, the Forum Funding System. Um, which is a crowdfunding system, so anyone can pitch up and they can say, I have this cool idea, I want to build a new logo for Monero because Kenneth just got a Monero logo tattooed on his wrist and so now's the time to change the logo. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so they can, they can pitch up with any idea. I mean, I don't think that Monero particularly needs marketing as an example, but there are people that do, and uh, there's a guy that's doing a whole outreach marketing thing, um, and then there are uh, two full-time researchers who are here, who get paid for um, their work on the Monero project um, by the, the forum funding system. Um, you get paid for by the forum funding system. Uh, so there are full-time developers that uh, use the FFS to, to pay their salary so that they can work on Monero. There are some people who also use the FFS to work on specific things. I'd like to build this particular feature. Um, and then we control the, the purse, um, that, uh, or the, the wallet that the money comes into, and we pay it out on milestones based on whether the community accepts the milestone um, as having been met or not. Um, so those are the three main ways that the, the project is funded. There's no pre-mine, there's no whatever, uh, uh, you know, portion of the block reward that comes to any central authority. In fact, there is no central authority. Um, we could all get hit by a bus tomorrow. This entire room could get nuked and like uh -huh. Monero would continue, but we'd be sad. <laughs> Excellent. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. All right. Any other questions? We have only eight more minutes are left, so only a few more questions. Okay, I'll repeat it then. First of all, this is sort of my, my first time in the room, so if you guys already talked about this, apologies. I know it's a very different kind of room. Okay, so the question is, what's the best? What are the, what are the best practices to take with securing your wallet? Uh, do you want Paul? Paul, do you want Paul? Do, yeah. Paul, do you want to talk about this a bit? Yeah. Don't take them on a boat. <laughs> yeah, and if you do, make sure it's paper. Make sure you write it down on paper. So um, the generally advised best practice is you want to generate your seed on a machine that's never been connected to the internet, and then you generally want to back that up in some way that's relatively secure. Um, you can go pretty far with that. You can encrypt the mnemonic or your seed. Uh, you can split it up and then encrypt those pieces and you can do all sorts of things. Um, for most people, you probably don't have to go too crazy with it. Um, it is important to know that if you lose that secret seed or the secret mnemonic, exactly, yeah, you don't have access to those funds anymore. and It would be extremely difficult or impossible to regain access. Um, and then, yeah, from there, there are just varying levels of um, more convenient but slightly less secure. Uh, for example, my Monero generates the seed on your computer, and the seed never leaves your computer, but it discloses the view key, which is necessary for scanning the blockchain, to the server of your choice, and then that server will do the scanning for you. And so that gives you the benefit of being able to jump on another device, and you don't have to scan the whole blockchain again. You just log in, and all your data is there. Um, but there is that slight trade-off there. Does that help? Um, can I ask you to, yeah. 
So, so yeah, and I mean, like, like in that, I think you also got to figure out your threat model, right? I mean, if your threat model is like, I want to fund my unborn daughter's college, then, you know, and, and that's what you want to do, or you want to have like a private store of value that no one knows about. Um, if that's your use case and that's your threat model, then yeah, cold storage, like off it goes um, into the safe, which goes in the boat that's at the bottom of the ocean, whatever. Like, you know, you, you figure out your threat model and, that's, and, and you deal with it accordingly. For regular spending or for, for keeping smaller amounts, um, there are mobile apps that are, are pretty decent. Obviously, my Monero, um, there's Cake Wallet, there's Monorujo, there's uh, Edge. X Wallet. And X Wallet. Um, and then if you want to use a hardware wallet, there are a bunch of really good hardware wallets. Uh, Ledger Nano S uh, just got support for Monero. Uh, Trezor says it's coming with the Model T. Um, and then there's um, uh, Casisto, which is the, the sort of Trezor-ish clone, our own thing that the Monero hardware guys built. Um, and then, of course, there's BitFi, which is unhackable. <coughs> Please don't use that. Please do not use that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just feel like they do. Um, I, I think in terms of hardware wallets, your, the Ledger Nano S is probably your best bet right now, or Casisto, if you can get hold of prototype hardware. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll wait for the Trezor or Model T to come out. OK, any other questions? Okay, so we want a general update on uh, the upcoming V8 software upgrade of Monero. Um, we'll, we'll get you to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I mean, there, there's, uh, there's small things that are going to be in there. It's nothing mind-blowing. I mean, there's the Kryptonite V8 uh, tweaks. The... Um, the small, the small thing the, the called small, bulletproofs. The small thing called no, well, bulletproofs. We hope will be live in it. It depends on the on if we on the third report. We're waiting on the third uh, audit on bulletproofs. Um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, bullet. I mean, bulletproofs has been live on testnet since December, um, and it's held up because people use testnet all the time. I promise. <laughs> and it's uh, it's been reasonably robust, and uh, we, the audits have been have been pretty good. So. Um, yeah, like hopefully bulletproofs. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, a couple other little sort of little itty bitty things, um, and performance gains. Some nice performance gains. Um, uh, nice improvements on sync, and then fluffy blocks. I think will be the the default way of um, moving blocks around the the network uh, from V8. It, that has already been. Oh, it's already happened. Cool. So that's from V7. <laughs> Yeah, I, hopefully um, the bulletproofs will make it in there because that's the, the it's a significant improvement to Monero's general protocol. Okay. It's, it's, it's early October though. Kind of we yeah. So so that was uh, I mean like we used to do March September, and then with the with V7 falling over to April October. I mean to April then the consensus that seems to be like we're just going to do October April October now moving forward. Um, I just click buttons. I, I don't, you know. <laughs> I mean, I just read the thing on the screen where people go, "This is what we're doing," and I go, "Oh." So, I, I know as much as you do. All right. So we have time for one more question. Who wants to close this panel out? I have a comment. There. So real quick. So anonymous a comment. Uh, just, uh, just real quick, since we were talking about Hacker One and whatnot, tomorrow I will be speaking briefly about our VRP, our Hacker One thing. I'll have slides, music. I hope to be really hungover from the party tonight, the epic Monero party we should have. Uh, I mean, uh, never mind, there's not a party. It's canceled. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Closing question, anyone? Uh, where's the party? He Excuse asked. me, it is not 6 p.m. yet. <laughs> it's not 6 p.m. <laughs> we need a non party question. Non party question. Anyone? And a non coin based question. Non coin based. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! I got one. Uh, it doesn't matter. Can we repeat that? <laughs> so, what um, is the optimal ring size? In, the answer: infinity minus one. Right? Yeah. Do, do you want? I, well, I. Do you want to here? You can speak first, and then oh, I'll, okay, I kind of want to speak on that too. That's fine. I was going to say the optimal ring size is orange. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, strictly from 
a general, you have more outputs as possible spenders, the higher is better, but you need to make sure that there are legitimate improvements and MRL has spent a lot of time looking at what these, like what the bottom line of these improvements are. I think at the moment it'll follow, it'll fall somewhere between 10 and 20. Okay, Brandon, let's, Brandon, you should, you should, okay, Brandon's agreeing with me, good. Okay, um, so given that it is now 6 p.m., we're going to wrap this panel. Let's have a round of applause for all of our participants, please. All right, um, and now, for the reason you're actually here, um, <laughs> we have, uh, is it Power Cycles coming up? Yeah, yeah, power cycle. Yeah, yeah, okay, so power cycle, you can just come up and uh, do your Hi. fancy announcement. Hi, sure. Actually, I'll let Sunman Flower do it because she's okay. a better speaker than I am. <laughs> you can hop on stage or stand right there, your choice. Get on the stage. On the stage? So the people that missed DEF CON and watch the recordings later can know when the party was that they missed. So, um, my name is Cinnamon Flower. Eat the, eat the mic. My name, can you hear me? Yes. Everybody, okay. My name is Cinnamon Flower. I worked on a lot of the art uh, for the village and for the party. And I'm one of the organizers for the party. Um, so I'm here to, to, to tell you a little bit about that. But before I do, what I wanted to say is that a lot of us volunteers, the Monero Hardware team in particular, who I worked with, we've been working for weeks and months on this. So I want to acknowledge all of their hard work and congratulate them on a successful village this year. And I also want to mention the fact that up until a couple days ago, a lot of us, we had no idea what each other looked like or sounded like because all of the communication was done over IRC, email, whatever. Um, but then we met. And I really feel like there is no substitute for meeting in person, talking, exchanging ideas. And this is what I feel that this evening should be about. I really feel like this evening should focus on people meeting, people talking, engaging, talking about what excites you, Monero, other projects maybe, but you know. Um, Merge. Yeah. <laughs> so if you came to the party last year, you know it was a lot of fun. But we had a lot of people walk in saying, I don't know anything about Monero, but I do want to learn. Like, who do I talk to? And I'm like, pretty much everybody here. So uh, they left the party excited and wanting to um, pitch in and help um, with the, the community. So, so that was, I'd say, the, the most thrilling part of the party last year and what I'd like to see tonight, hopefully a little bit more. And. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Power Cycle. He's going to give you a little bit of the history of how the party started, which is kind of funny. Not everybody knows how it started, but you go ahead and tell us that. Thank you. Um, real quick, the party is in the Forum Tower, room 6116, because that's what I know you that's all That's the fake in. number, right? <laughs> right. right. Nine. <laughs> nine o'clock. It starts at nine. Uh, we're supposed to go till 2 a.m., so feel free to drop by um, anytime. Um, uh, about the party, how it came together is, is I was just coming to, to DEF CON and said, hey, does anybody want to meet up? And sort of the community just started to pitch in more and more. And uh, we had a great party last year. And that's essentially what we did again this year. So there's a lot of contributors. It, there are no corporate sponsors or anything like that. This is all the individuals um, just wanting to get together and, and mingle you know, outside of the tech thing that, that we're all doing during the day. So everyone is invited. It's an open party, and uh, please tell your friends and bring them all. There's a DJ, right? Several. Several DJs. Yeah, we need to get into the uh, elevator. No. No, you don't. Um, and if anyone would like to uh, help me out, I could use some help moving some ice and stuff like that, so come find me afterwards. Um, somebody had a question there in the back? He's volunteering to help you. OK. <laughs> You're in. Yes, you the board. Room 6116. It's a palindrome. Yes. The forum, forum Tower. 
And if you look on Reddit, there's a, I just did a post that says the, the room number as well. If you look on my Twitter account, it says the room number on the Which subreddit? pinned tweet. On the Monero subreddit. Yeah. Reddit.com slash r slash Monero. Okay. Thank you. Cool.